a question from the Stowe campus, and it'll say, uh, it says, how do you respond to non-believers who accuse Christians of being hateful to people who support lifestyles that are not according to the precepts of our faith? I think this is a very important question, and they all are, really. Um, I'd be a dishonest person if I said to you that that question doesn't worry me, that I don't even think about it. In fact, we as a team, our entire team, people like Nabil Qureshi, Michael Ramsden, Oz Guinness, Amy Ori Ewing, our entire speaker's team, have often sat around the table and said, you know, how do we deal with this very trying social issue of our time? And even though the word is not used here, the idea is, you know, the, the homosexual lifestyle and all that has come about in our time, how do we as Christians deal with it? So Joe, if you don't mind, I'd like to take an extended answer on this, you know, let me give you about three panels of an answer. The first panel is the logical problem. The second panel is what I call the theological problem. And the third panel is what I would call the relational problem, how you communicate it. So let me take, first of all, the sociological issue here. What is the problem now? We talk about tolerance. So when I was at one of the prestigious universities, somebody went to the microphone and asked this question. And I said to the person, I said, I will be glad to answer your question if you will first answer mine. What kind of a culture are we living in? You have to define it for me. I said, as far as I know, there are three cultures in relation to absolute. The first, the first culture is called a theonomous culture, where the law of God is supposedly so embedded into our hearts that we all emotively or otherwise think in the same categories. Once upon a time, we would talk about the natural law in those categories, natural law. We believe these truths to be self-evident. The early framers believed in the natural law. We don't believe in natural law anymore, but we used to talk about it, and that's a theonomous culture, theos, God, nomos, law. Sometimes the Indian culture will get close to that. It's not always the case, but they sort of dharti ke admi is what they will say. We are people of the soil. And the idea of respect for parents and all of that, they consider to be self-evident, uh, ingrained in the heart of man and so on. But we don't believe in the theonomous culture in the, in the West. So what's the second kind of culture? The second kind of culture is a heteronomous culture. Heteros meaning another, nomos meaning law. So we have another law. What does that mean? The mainstream of the culture is dictated to by the leadership at the top. If you look at Marxism in secular terms, it is a heteronomous culture. The handful in the top will control the masses. If you look at Islam, it's a heteronomous culture. If you go to Saudi Arabia or you go to Iran, which are supposed to be truly Islamic countries, the mullahs or the sheikhs or who are the ayatollahs at the top will tell the masses when they must fast, when they can eat, what they must wear, what they must not wear, who they can be seen with, who they cannot be seen with. All of the dictates, even to the discipline of how you wash your hands and feet before you worship and so on. It's a heteronomous culture. The few at the top dictate it for the masses below. So I looked at the question and I said, are we a theonomous culture? He said, no. I said, are we a heteronomous culture? He said, no, we don't want the few to dictate it for the many. I said, so that leaves us with the third, which is an autonomous culture. Autos meaning self, nomos meaning law, which means each person dictates their own moral prerogatives in the sense. I said, are we an autonomous culture? He said, yes. I said, all right, now tell me this. If we are an autonomous culture, and I answer your question, are you going to give me the privilege of my autonomy too? Or as soon as you disagree with my answer, you will switch to a heteronomous mode and dictate for me what I must believe as well. That is the sociological dilemma. That is the sociological dilemma, because if A disagrees with B, it's not just that A is being enforcing his or her principles upon B, but B wants to enforce his or her principles upon A. So there's a mutual autocracy being sought here, but it is never going to be consistent in a culture that is neither theonomous nor heteronomous. Autonomous cultures run into a conflict where everybody has their own autonomy. That's the, law, that's the sociological issue. You move beyond that then to the theological issue. The theological issue is this way. Years ago, I was doing some open forums at uh, Indiana University, 
and the press reporter was, I was there with Dallas Willard, we were both doing the defense of the Christian faith, and a press reporter came and said she was filming some uh, religious actions on campus for, uh, for their network and so on. Uh, do you mind if we tape what you're going to talk about tonight? I said, no, that's all right, you're welcome. But she, then she startled me by saying, we'll only be there for about five minutes, and then we'll be packing up and leaving. I hope we won't disturb you. And I thought, well, this is what the news does with a talk, takes five minutes of it, and then tells people that this is what was said, you know? I thought, okay, but I wasn't going to argue with that. I said, ma'am, you're welcome to leave. Just tell your crew to be very quiet, because once I get into the thick of it, I really don't like the distraction, and they'll be quiet, slipping out, I'll be okay. She stayed the whole time, stayed for the whole talk, stayed for the Q&A, and then she said, can I walk you back to where you're staying? I was staying on the campus. I said, right, and she was walking with me. It's quite dark at this time. And she says, um, I have a question for you. I said, is this on the record or is this an off the record question? <laughs> she said, no, this is for me. I said, so you promise me this is just between you and me and I'm going to these answers. I said, no. okay. I said, all right, I just want to know. And so she said, you know, I have a problem with Christianity and here's my problem. Christians are generally against racism, but when it comes to the homosexual, they discriminate against the homosexual. How do you explain that? I said, I find your comments so interesting. In the first part of the question, it's an ism you're talking about. In the second part of the question, you particularize it with an individual. So I'm just fascinated by that, but that's okay. I said, here's what I want to say to you. The reason we believe that discrimination ethnically is wrong is because the race and ethnicity of a person is sacred. You do not violate a person's ethnicity and race. It is a sacred gift. And the reason we believe in an absoluteness to sexuality is because we believe sexuality is sacred as well. And that's why we make our choice that same way. I said, you will help me if you will tell me why you treat race as sacred and desacralize sexuality. She was very quiet. She said, I've never thought of it in those terms. Here's what I want to say to you. Marriage, as God has given it to us, and if you take the whole corpus of the worldview, is the most sacred relationship into which you will enter. Because love is given one word in English, but there are four words in the Greek. Agape, eros, storge, and agape, phileo, Storge and Eros. Agape is God's love. Phileo is friendship love or brotherly love. Storge is protective love or parental love. Eros is romantic love. I said, do you realize marriage is the only one that pulls these four together? Agape, Phileo, Storge, and Eros. I said, and if you take Agape out of that, Eros is gone for whatever you want to do. Romantic love becomes redefined. And to us, the Bible gives the sacredness of marriage as Christ is to the church, the bridegroom and the bride. And in that sacredness and the beauty of a consummate relationship between a man and a woman, as it is shown in the singular commitment of the marital vow, I do and I will. When you say I do to the one, you say I don't to all of the others. And you say, I will to one, you're saying, I won't to all of the others. So any departure from that beauty and sacredness of the four confluences of love is a biblical notion of what it really means to be married. And to just take one behavior and make it look like it's aberrant is not right. All departures from that are not acceptable in the sight of God. The theological position is a consummate relationship between a man and a woman in the procreative act and in the sacredness and paying each other the ultimate compliment of taking each other at their word. So theologically, this is the way we see it. So theologically, we've been put into a conundrum. So we come then in relationally, how do we deal with it? And here's the hard part. But you know what? And my wife will tell you this, others will tell you this who know me. I accept people with a love and a genuineness regardless of what their view is on anything, if it's different to mine. I have learned to love humanity. I can put my arm around a 
person who has a different view on marriage or a different view on politics or whatever and just say, you know, God gives you the most sacred gift of the prerogative of choice, but God does not give you the privilege of determining a different outcome to what the choice will entail. The consequences are bound to the choice. And you go right back to the book of Genesis and it tells you, you do what is right, will not you, will you not be accepted? But if you don't, sin stalks at the, at the door, desires to have you. And so when I look at the sacredness of marriage, any change from it from the biblical point of view is a departure from the biblical mandate. But at the same time, the Bible commands us to love even those with whom we disagree. And our responsibility as the church is never to hate the individual. Our privilege is to love. And only God can change the heart of a person. And God is the ultimate judge. And in a pluralistic society, let us as Christians be both light and salt and learn to love one another. And let God be the judge over all of us. He is the one who is pure in his judgments. We can make errors. Those are the three panels I want to leave with you.